Hi, I'm WTOP Entertainment Editor Jason Fraley, and we are here with the one and only Ben Mankiewicz of Turner Classic Movies, and of course, also the grandson of Herman Mankiewicz, whose story is chronicled in Mank, which hits Netflix on December 4th. Hey, thanks so much for joining us, Ben. Uh, Jason, thanks for having me. Um, I know you're a DC guy, at least originally, yeah. before you, you know, your career blossomed as it has. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but first, we're talking... Citizen Kane is what all this is based on. Um, it's exalted as the you know greatest movie ever by the American Film Institute, which I'm sure some people will, everyone will have their own opinion on whether that's true or not. But uh, why do you, I mean, maybe if some of our listeners are new to this and maybe don't see it, or maybe they did see it in a, in a film class sometime, why is it held in such regard, both in terms of Wells' directing symbolism and your grandfather's you know groundbreaking fracturing of the narrative in his script? Well, uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, it was a big deal when it came out in 1941. This was a, uh, yeah, a character in Charles Foster Kane who was very clearly modeled on William Randolph Hearst, who was as influential a publisher, perhaps as there's ever been in American history, uh, owned hundreds of papers across the country. And, you know, as much as people bemoan the media and the press today, I mean, you know, there was, while there was great journalism, in some ways better journalism than there is now, papers took strong positions and their stories reflected that. I mean, it was changing slightly in the 1940s, but we had a long history of, uh, of, uh, of significantly slanted news and, and great news, great reporters. I mean, the reporting was, was news, you know, look, it was because it was newspapers, right? And not television and television. And I make my living in television and worked in TV news, but TV news is not significantly advanced the cause of journalism, at least over the past 20, 25 years. Um, Howard Beale. So, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, um, so, you know, when, uh, when Kane came out, it was a, a big deal. And, and, and uh, Wells, uh, excuse me, and uh, Hearst tried to, uh, you know, stop it and, and threw out his, his uh, minions and his uh, people who were responsible to him in the press and who he paid off, tried to stop the movie. It wasn't solely based on Hearst. That's the thing. It was based on a few industrialists, one of them Hearst, but the character in Kane most represented Hearst. So it was a 1941 uh, big deal movie with a tremendous amount of heat behind it. And it was this guy, Orson Welles, who'd come out from, from New York where he was the radio broadcaster and ran the wonderful Mercury Theater. It was his first movie. And he came out to California at 24, got this unbelievable contract from RKO, uh, make two movies and do it every one. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you'll <laughs> right. You'll you'll uh, 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 produce, write, direct, and star in these movies, and and that drew instant resentment, as you might imagine, from those who were established in Hollywood, not just directors, but everybody. Like, why does, why does this kid get this deal? He'd done War of the Worlds in 1938, which you know scared thousands of Americans. It's often reported as millions. Of almost certainly not true, uh, into believing that Martians had invaded New Jersey. Um, but it was quite a thing, and, uh, and he had this great theater success. So it was those two things put together, um, and then Hearst's attempt to stop it. Um, so there was just all this sort of publicity around it that was organic, right? Um, uh, and then it was great, right? And then Wells made us strong campaign to keep it out of theaters first and then it was great and then it got nominated for 10 oscars but it only won one almost certainly because of i keep saying wells but because of hearst's campaign right to stop the movie um and as you say it was brilliant it was innovative it broke through um you know wells had all these deep focus shots it just didn't look like a movie before and then the narrative structure of it which moved back and forth which mank does too, the Netflix film, David Fincher's film. Uh, it broke ground. Uh, you know, Wells had significant help uh, from really talented professionals. My, uh, my grandfather, Herman Mankiewicz, with the screenplay, uh, Greg Toland on the cinematography, who really showed Wells these shots. Uh, you know, as, as addition to many others, notably Robert Wise in, right. in the editing of the picture. So, but the narrative of the story around it became that this is Wells's movie. And it is, it is Wells's movie. I mean, the sheer force of producing to get it done, the, um, uh, the, the innovative breakthrough directing and this incredible performance. But 
I mean, it's mu as much a collaborative effort as any movie that was ever made, but Wells was a self promoter too, and a good one. And, and I don't even think that's bad really, but he wanted to live up to the terms of his contract. So it became like this, oh my God, this kid has made all by himself this movie that no one has ever uh, seen before. And that was, uh, that was not the case. That's a bit. And then, uh, sorry, I know it's been a long answer, but then it went away like so many classic movies do. And there were uh, supporters of it. But then in 1970, 71, Pauline Kael published her piece um, uh, the, about the making of Citizen Kane and Raising Kane. And, uh, uh, and then the European filmmakers, those critics, uh, many of whom became directors, Francois Truffaut, and, uh, they developed this keen appreciation for it and it started having this art house revival. And then before long, you know, the Cahiers du Cinema, which is the uh, noted French magazine and they said it was the best movie ever made um but it took 30 years off <laughs> before <laughs> people came back to acknowledge that it was or to say that it was the greatest movie ever made sorry for that long answer no I'm, you kidding me i'm eating it up <laughs> um i want to unpack a couple of things you said you 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 think you, you mentioned that it was nominated for what like almost 10 oscars but only I, one I, I think it was 10 10 it might have been nine do you do you and you said that it, you know you, that it was hearst that basically campaigned so that it wouldn't win all those um do you think wells was at least happy that it went to john ford because he said his favorite was john ford john ford and john ford were his three favorite directors because <laughs> how green was my valley yeah, sure. i mean you know i i think wells probably knew what was coming i mean there's no question he was disappointed that it didn't win best picture he didn't win best director um, but, you know, in a sense, it's, you know, I don't know, it's better. Like, like this, <laughs> and that's part of the narrative of the making of the movie, that there was this movement to stop it. And that somehow, you know, a good picture, How Green With My Valley, the wins best picture. It's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. It's as silly as, as you know, Shakespeare in Love uh, beating Save a Pri saving, saving Private Ryan. It makes no sense. Yeah. But that only, that only is now elevated this uh, Citizen Kane because it's like, oh my God. And, and that's the thing that, that Wells fought these headwinds with help from, from RKO and George Schaefer, but, but he fought these headwinds. That, that's almost the most impressive thing about these movies is his sheer force of will and personality uh, and drive to get, the, to get the picture made. Louis B. Mayer offered the production costs and then some to RKO for the movie and then he was just gonna bury it. Right, yeah. And Louis B. Mayer is very poorly uh, represented, well acted, but poorly represented uh, in in Mank. Oh yeah, the movie doesn't do him any favors at all. <laughs> no, but you mentioned no, no. you mentioned that uh, the the Kale book, which I think is a good way to tee up Mank itself, is you know that that Kale writes Raising Cane, which was very I'd say more anti Wells pro Mank in terms of how much involvement Wells she claimed didn't have in it. And then I know Peter Bogdanovich kind of took the alternate stance in the Cane Mutiny, where he was trying to argue for Wells's involvement. Um, where, where do you come down in terms of your historic, you know, understanding of what happened in that? Uh, I, come down on the, I come down on the truth, which is that my grandfather is by far most responsible for the screenplay. It seems very obvious to me. And then Wells did a tremendous job of condensing it. I'm a, I would, you could argue Wells deserved half the credit for it, but he, he, my grandfather wrote the movie. And then Wells and came up with that structure. And so, ooh you know, a, a decency today would have had you leave your name off. Even a director who, who condensed it and sort of put it together in a, in a, in a new way. Right. Um, but, you know, if you want to put your name on it, fine. Okay. And my grandfather did take $10,000 to keep his name off it. Um, and then realized he'd written the only thing he was proud of and wanted his name on. I got no beef with that at all. Um, and, and Wells ought to have uh, responded to that, but he didn't because there was this hype around it. That's what I believe that he had to have done everything. That's the mere fact of paying 10 grand to keep the writer who wrote, who wrote it off. I mean, yeah. you know, my grandfather made a lot of money. He was the highest paid writer in Hollywood, then lost it all. He was a gambler, he was a drinker. He was fun to be around. He wasn't a mean drunk, he was a fun drunk, but he was a drunk and uh, he sabotaged his own career. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he became proud of this. So, and I think then, you know, I love Peter Bogdanovich and uh, we did our first podcast on, on, on Peter, you know? Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the plot thickens, I'm still Peter Bogdanovich. It's the name of the podcast. We're, we're very proud of it. I hope you get the plug in, everybody check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. So, um, 
uh, and a woman named Angela Caron. I want to make sure credit goes around. She produced it. She's the one most responsible for it. And I did the interview with Peter and I contributed and I, you know, but it's Angela is most responsible for it. I could take, I could see me taking half credit, but she, her name would go first. Um, you got $10,000 yeah. to leave your name off it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got uh, I got zero dollars. I mean, I got what TCM <laughs> pays me. I was I asked. I was like, so the pie is different, you know? And they were like, yeah, no. Why don't you just do it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, but anyway, they were great and supportive. They really were. Um, so I think that what motivated Peter and others, and Peter, I mean, I won't put words in his mouth. He doesn't resist this notion that my grandfather certainly most responsible for the screenplay and probably and i think not probably significantly responsible for the screenplay mm -hmm. most significantly um but that what pauline kale's piece did was minimize wells across the board right made it seem like it wasn't really wells's movie and i think that's wrong right i mean it is if you're going to name one person whose movie it is it's orson wells's movie that sheer force of will to get it produced this brilliant directing um, uh, the condensing of the screenplay, but and then this unbelievable starring performance playing a guy over a lifetime, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's uh, so. I think they responded to that, like, "Are you kidding me? You're diminishing Orson Welles. You don't know anything about movies." That was the filmmakers' complaint. Those who, those who, uh, um, hang on, uh, those who, uh, that was the filmmakers' complaint. Um, that is, excuse me, that is a filmmaker's complaint that, um, that about Kale, those two who don't, didn't appreciate her work, many did, that like, hey man, you don't know anything about movies, you do not know, you're sitting here picking on this process that you do not understand, um, and we're not pretending that it's necessarily some impossible process to grasp, but you don't have it, um, so I think that Wells was unfairly minimized in general in by Pauline Kael, but I don't think my grandfather was improperly elevated by Pauline Kael, and of course, both those things can be true. Yeah, you can hold both of those at the same time. Um, that's right. And I, so, and I know that's that sort of uh, push and pull came factored into the the script itself, because so David Fincher's father, Jack Fincher, wrote I think an early draft yeah. like long ago, like in the '90s or something, right? Um, and is it true that you know those early drafts were sort of Anti Wells as well, and then Fincher kind of put him back in there a little bit while maintaining what you're saying that it is your grandfather's script. Yeah, I mean, it isn't really about Mank is not does not is not about who wrote the script, right? I mean, at the end of the movie, you're like, oh, Herman Mank was wrote the script, but that it's about a writer, right? It's sort of representative of. Uh, of Hollywood and all that was right about Hollywood and, and a lot of what was wrong. Writers have been diminished in Hollywood, you know, ever since they sort of let the Directors Guild get that last credit. Um, and, you know, I don't know that the director should have that last credit. It seems like the writer ought to be on that same page. Now, the writers, you know, frequently there's five writers on a movie. So, I mean, I get it, you know. But the writers have been diminished uh, over the course of Hollywood and, and uh, you know, I, I think that's insane. <laughs> so uh, Fincher, this brilliantly talented, innovative breakthrough director, one of the you know top directors working today, and I don't think there's any question about that. Love it. Uh, he wanted to tell the story of a Hollywood writer who, you know, uh, as Fincher says in the piece that I did for CBS Sunday Morning, you know, was constantly, um, you know, at the top of uh, the hill and then would say, oh, look, I'm going to look at this boulder. What if I push this boulder down the hill? And then I walked out and tried to push it up again, my, you know, in gravel, uh, as Venture said. So, and as I said, he was a drunk, he was a gambler, um, but he was brilliant and sort of universally recognized as brilliant. And his fall, his self-inflicted fall was sad for a lot of people to see. Um, but he was this breakthrough writer. I mean, he brought all these great writers out to LA, you know, the famous telegram he sent to Ben Hecht, which is, you know, basically get out here as, as soon as you can. There's millions to be made. Everyone else is an idiot. Hey. Um, so you wouldn't have had uh, Prius or any of Hecht's great works without oh, that. So, yeah. Right. And I, I left out the last line. I can't believe it. That's why I always complain to people they left out the last line. Get out here as soon as you can. There's millions to be made. Everyone else is an idiot. Don't let this get around. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> that's uh, the that's the zinger right there. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, uh, talk about the you know, but Fincher's decision to shoot it too in 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 black and white. It kind of evokes that time. Um, and even he, you know, he has the typewriter, you know, slug lines of the script appearing, in, you know, like, mm -hmm. and the way, like you mentioned earlier, the way he sort of structured it, like Citizen Kane, how it's sort of a collection of memories. They say you can't, um, you know, define one person's life in just a straight two hour movie, but is sort of the idea like, like Kane or like your dad with your, your grandfather did with Kane, Fincher tries to do that with this movie, right? Yeah, and I think it's really, I think it really works. I think it's good. You know, the movie basically is set in 1940. My grandfather had broken his leg in a terrible car accident. He was going to drive across the country and not long. He wasn't driving, but broke his leg very badly, um, which was just an excuse for then him to sit around and drink even more. But uh, Wells and John Houseman, who was a critic, by the way, Houseman was a critical factor in getting Kane made and the producing. So, I mean, you know, Wells had help with everything except the act, significant help from really brilliant people. Uh, and Hausman, by the way, you know, said that Hausman thinks he contributed a lot. And he, well, he's quite likely to have, he was there with my grandfather in Victorville. So my grandfather breaks his leg and Wells and Hausman arranged to take him three hours or so into the desert uh, from, uh, not really into the desert, but to three hours, you know, from Los Angeles in uh, inland and, uh, uh, and north, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've been there, I've been to the house. Uh, uh, where where he wrote Citizen Kane and and he stayed there for you know basically three months and wrote the screenplay and they kept booze from him and uh, and you know and 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 Houseman supervised the writing and and contributed to it the movie and Fincher acknowledges this is is, is not really fair to John Houseman but how, if Houseman's role had been depicted accurately it you know diminishes the story about Herman so even he was like yeah Houseman kind of took a bullet on this one. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so anyway, he breaks his leg, writes the, uh, uh, writes the screenplay, uh, writes the screenplay there. And then Fincher does the movie, as you alluded to in, in these flashbacks from, I think, 31, 34 and 37 is part bits and pieces of Herman's life as he's this superstar in 31. And, and then in 34 and 37, you can sort of start to see his disillusionment with Hollywood which was true. He was embarrassed by how he made his living. He, you know, you'd be a theater critic or a journalist um, or write plays. That was, that was a proper way to make a living. He had a very demanding father who disapproved of many things and, um, you know, and disapproved of, of filmmaking, though he was very happy with the rewards <laughs> that filmmaking <laughs> brought him uh, through his kids. You know, he, he liked that life that they were able to uh, provide for him. So, um, and yeah, you know, and each scene starts with, you know, exterior MGM studios and the date and day, you know, it looks like a, looks like a screenplay. Um, yeah. And Fincher finishing his dad's work, you know, puts for me, for me and for Fincher, these, uh, you know, these, these sort of, uh, uh, loops of, uh, family, these family connections, uh, on the movie, which is, which is nice. And Fincher clearly reworked his dad's. Uh, screenplay pretty significantly, but he told me that he he really kept the the structure of his of his father's work. And you'll notice that David Fincher says written by Jack Fincher. He's not saying written by Jack Fincher and David Fincher, uh, <laughs> which which would have been the noble thing for Wells to do. But again, at twenty four, I, I get it. I understand why he wanted to fulfill that contract. Wanted to be the the boy wonder, the kid who did everything. For sure. And so cinephiles, you know, like us will, uh, watching that, I feel, I felt sort of the same way as, you know, like when you're watching Bad and the Beautiful or something where you're like, oh, that character's that person. Except here is there, you know, actual names, you, you know, you get Louis B. Mayer, you get Irving Thalberg, the death of him, Marion Davies, there's a great scene between them of, you know, please forgive me if it makes it into the movie, please forgive me if it does. Um, but is there anything you learned about old Hollywood through this? Or, or maybe you knew it all already, but, but we're glad to see included. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think it was so perfectly d depicted. Not, not that I know exactly. I mean, even after 17 years at the TCM, I, you know, and we're, you know, we're what the day to day life was. But I just feel like he nailed it, right? You know, I mean, Louis V. Mayer thought it doesn't really matter who the director is. I'm overstating it, but the, you know, the, <laughs> this is an MGM production, right? This is we know how to make movies, and then we slot people in. Sort of like the way the Bond producers thought, like, it's not that big a deal who we hire for Bond. Whoever we hire for Bond, we make into Bond. 
you know, they were going to bring George Lazenby back. They were like, by the way, which his movie, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, actually quite good. Um, and Lazenby, he, he goofed that up. Um, so, Rest in peace, you know, Sean Connery. We, that just happened. So, yes. Feeling it. Um, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Connery, most people, I think, think it's the best Bond. Most people were around then. I, I think there there's merits to all of them, and including certainly the uh, Daniel Craig, the, the most recent one. I like Roger Moore too. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, Pierce Brosnan and Timothy Dalton. I, they're all okay. They're, yeah. I mean, they're better than okay. I think they were, many of them were good. The stories weren't all. Anyway, we're not talking about that. So yeah. the, um, uh, um, so yeah, I think he got classic Hollywood, you know, and he got Louis B. Mayer's power, um, which was, you know, nearly absolute. Um, and Thalberg's sort of uh, brilliance. Right, as the head of production uh, at MGM, and you know, and the sort of there was a camaraderie among writers, certainly, you know, and uh, I think they captured that the importance of the writer, and you can even see the importance of the writer diminish um, over the course of the movie, as my grandfather sort of again becomes humiliated uh, by what he does and, and self sabotages sort of uh, tragically, and and that's what he wanted to portray. I think Fincher, this sort of tragic figure. And through the screenwriter, and, and Fincher has just this, you know, uh, 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 well of support uh, for screenwriting, right? For for that that part of the process, and he thought that it was, you know, really appealing to tell a classic Hollywood story through the through a really interesting character, uh, a great screenwriter who hated that he was great at this. This, yeah. you know popcorn frivolousness he was wrong he should have been enormously proud uh <laughs> but he wasn't a fun role for gary oldman for sure man he can oh, yeah, he just he can play winston churchill and then do this and it's just i love watching him transform from film to film it's he's incredible every every real quick everybody was so good here you know uh uh, Amanda Seyfried is Marion Davies, just, you know, I mean, she's a good actress. She just seemed to elevate. She told me in an interview that, that David Fincher has this way of making you feel like you've been lazy uh, in everything else you've made, like, because he's so intense. And I mean, she meant it as a compliment. It is that he brings this thing out where you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I coasted uh, through these uh, uh, other roles. And, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, not just Amanda Seyfried, but, you know, Lily Collins as my grandfather's secretary. Uh, Rita Alexander, who, by the way, you know, is my father, who was a, a, a you know, very proud of his dad's work, but uh, he would always quote Rita when asked, you know, how much of the screenplay uh, did Wells write? <laughs> and she would say, not one word. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, and she was, she was with Herman the entire time there up in Victorville taking care of him because he was, that leg was so badly broken, he was in bed the entire time unless they put him in a wheelchair and pushed him out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I loved about it too is it's not as there's so much about you know old Hollywood and of course your grandfather just as a man, but there's it's about so much more. There's there's the whole political backdrop too with the race for governor of California with Upton Sinclair versus uh, Frank Miriam, um, who's you know, and then all Hearst tie, Hearst and Mayor's involvement with that. Um, talk about how how that's gonna play. Sort of we're up. I mean, we're doing, this this piece will air before, after the election, but you and I are talking on the eve of a pivotal election right now as we speak. Talk about how this movie might land um, politically in terms of you know, there's lots of trumping up fears of socialism in the movie. There's there's a guy cutting new news reels trying to play up those fears. Um, it's very timely in that well in that way. It is. Um... Do you lose me when that happens? Yeah. When only, I get a phone only, call? It only happened okay. twice, right, but it's all right. Uh, okay, so um, uh, I think it is uh, certainly politically uh, timely. I don't know if timely is the right word. It's politically relevant, you know. Um, we have had a, a long and rich history that, uh, uh, that Donald Trump uh, was not the first to uh, attempt to exploit and his sort of, you know, sycophants in the, in the media that, that whoever's running against the conservative is bringing socialism to America. Nonsense. It's dishonest. Um, uh, but there was happening in 1934 and, you know, and, and uh, sort of the corporate world, the powerful establishment of which much of it is, is political 
you know, has uh, tried to maintain the status quo, that there's this sort of fear of economic failure if we give people health care. And you see that uh, in the movie. I mean, Upton Sinclair was much more of a socialist than anyone who has run for president in our time, including Bernie Sanders, who may in his heart be a socialist, but, you know, he's running as a democratic socialist. And, you know, I don't know how anybody can see, you know, look, man, uh, you know, I got it's free market. We want to encourage a free market. I'm a capitalist, you know. Um, and, but I don't know that, you know, we need a split of, you know, we're 99, 1% of the population. That's <laughs> 99% of the wealth. It's a problem. And capitalism works if it's regulated. And right. Really, that's an argument over how much to regulate it. I mean, right. Everybody wants, everybody except libertarians want to regulate it. So anyway, I, I, I think the movie captures that nicely that that was happening uh, in the 1930s, although that particular Upton Sinclair story isn't really true um, about in in relation to, you know, Mayor and, and my grandfather. But it, it, you know, when you tell a story like this, you find a thing that can tell you the truth, even though that event might not be true. And I think Fincher very clearly uh, told the truth about what was happening in, in, in Hollywood and the kind of thing that my grandfather uh, uh, would have taken a, a, a stand against. For sure. Uh, remind our, I mean, on the subject of politics, remind our listeners, uh, you know, your involvement, born in D.C., but who your father was. He was very involved in politics here. Yeah, I mean, look, I think my father's the smartest man, Kowitz, and I don't think it's close. Um, <laughs> but my father was the smartest. I mean, I look, a lot of kids say their fathers were great. He, I mean, there's hardly anyone who doesn't think my father was the smartest guy in the room, in whatever room they were in. Uh, and he was, you know, kind and warm and funny, and everyone basically thought that too, except my mom. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, she thought that for a while, though. Uh, and so uh, he didn't want to, you know, he felt the same uh, thing that his father felt, that Hollywood was not an appropriate way to make a living, right? It's not a noble way to make a living. Now, my dad, he was an entertainment lawyer for a bit, had some fun clients, Steve McQueen, James Mason. But when uh, Jack Kennedy was elected, he thought, no, this is what you're supposed to do. There's a call to action, right, to make it better. And he joined the Peace Corps, became Latin American director of the Peace Corps. That's where he met Bobby Kennedy and became Bobby Kennedy's press secretary and uh, announced his death to the country. And uh, well, people who were alive then are, are remember that. It's such a terrible day. And uh, but and as, again, it was you know, Jack Kennedy's call to action that got him in the Peace Corps. And then he ran George McGovern's campaign. He was president of National Public Radio for for five years. And then finally, when he was 60, he started, you know, he made a little money. Um, uh, we, we were asked by a reporter, my brother and I, um, what's the biggest misconception um, of the Mankiewicz family? And, and uh, my brother gave a very quick, that we're rich, right? And that was, uh, um, uh, uh, there's a side of it that is, but uh, uh, tragically not our side. We do just fine. I'm not not knocking it, but I like I like that answer. Um, so uh, my dad was a big deal in, in politics in, in DC. I mean we'd go to the supermarket together every Saturday and inevitably people would come up to him and I was, you know, eight, nine, eight, nine, ten years old and blown away. I'd be like, you don't know who that person is. And they just talk to you. <laughs> you know, um, uh, so, uh, my dad was a very influential guy for a long time in, uh, in democratic politics and really had a keen understanding of, uh, politics. He, he died in 2014. These last four years would have been tough because he was always incredibly optimistic, tons of Republican friends about the future uh, of the country, that it was always better. Um, and I think he would have, a, he would have had a very tough time uh, in these last four years. I wish he were here, but, uh. I'm, I'm grateful in a sense. So is my brother, Josh, a correspondent, Dateline NBC, that uh, that he, he wasn't around for this. Right. Well, before we run, uh, remind our listeners of, of your journey. You know, didn't you, didn't you start out George Michael Sports Machine? So a little Brenner action? I did. <laughs> yeah, I was, so the first year I worked, uh, first, you know, summer after my, I guess, sophomore year, I worked at the George Michael Sports Machine uh, with a friend of mine, Jim Altman, who's a reporter now in Hartford, Connecticut, with like, I don't know, 38 Emmys. And uh, uh, also from DC. And then we came back the next year and worked for uh, Glenn Brenner, who was, you know, uh, really the sort of one of the finest broadcasters I, I've ever seen. Um, I just, I'm not trying to badmouth George, but George was a little tougher and, uh, and could be a, a difficult guy and sort of threatening. It's our first day there as interns, 
he talked about what stays in the sports room. He said, he can't, I can't, we can't share it with the newsroom. We can't share it with anybody. Somebody he told the kid about a previous intern uh, wrote a story about working here with the American university paper. And, you know, a kid's never going to work in this business again. So the next summer, uh, Jimmy and I go to work for Glenn Brenner. And we tell Brenner that story. <laughs> and Brenner, the producer, they just start laughing. And they're, Let me tell you this. Uh, you start telling people around town about George, I guarantee you'll work in this business for the next 50 years. Um, <laughs> uh, he goes, I'll personally see to it that you always have a job. Uh, and Brenner was an incredibly funny. His you know, death and his sudden death was really, I, you know, it shook me at a, at a young age. Uh, real quick, I just remember Brenner during a snowstorm and they're all on the set and, you know, in DC and snow is still like the apocalypse. Right. No and, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, Doug Hill was doing weather then at the oh, at yeah. channel nine and, and Brenner just really just gets up and so he can't even see his head and he comes around Doug Hill and, and he starts rubbing his shoulders <laughs> on the air. And he's like, and he leans down, he's like whispering in his ear, he's like, come on, we're all counting on you. You can do it. This is going to be good. You're the man. You're the man. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, he was great. Uh, all those guys were great. Max Robinson, Gordon Peterson, Maureen Bunyan, you know, J.C. Hayward, um, I, you know, Mike Buchanan. Uh, so I, my brother was a television reporter. I became a television reporter um, and, uh, you know, liked the camaraderie and liked getting things done quickly and the pressure of a deadline. But, you know, we were doing silly stories and I didn't want to I didn't want to continue. I wanted to cover politics if I was going to work in TV and that just wasn't going to happen. We didn't have a political reporter. We covered political stories when they came up. And, uh, so I came out here. Uh, I had a great job in Miami at this unique TV station that uh, sort of let you have an opinion and you had to back it up. And we got to call you know, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, can I say prick? Because that's what we call, <laughs> called him on the air. And we got to take a side in the Elian Gonzalez uh, story, that, that you know, amazing uh, and tragic story about the Cuban kid who came over, lost his mother, but survived, and his father wanted him back in Cuba, and his Cuban-American family wanted to keep him. And it was great to be able to cover those stories in the manner that we did cover the 2000 election. And then I just got out of the business after that when that station went off the air. It didn't seem like that kind of thing was ever going to happen again. I came out to L.A. I auditioned for 138 jobs. That number is barely exaggerated. <laughs> uh, and then I landed the best one that I was up for at the at TCM in, uh, in 2000, summer 2003. I started in the fall and it's been a great 17 years. I hope there's, uh, hope there's many more. You've interviewed everyone under the sun there, um, and not to mention colleagues, rest in peace, Robert Osborne. Like you've you've been around some, yeah. some legends. I hate when everyone asks me who was your favorite interview, but um, is there is there anyone that any of those stars or anything that you got to sit down with that was like ultimate ultimate bucket list for you? Um, I don't think of it as, as bucket list. I mean, Bruce Springsteen was amazing for me because I'm a huge, long-time Springsteen fan. You know, I know there are people who've seen him more, but I've probably seen him 40 times. And it matters to me. He was great. I, I never wanted to meet him if I didn't have something to talk about. And I didn't want to be, you know, hey, love your music. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, which he, you know, was, loves hearing, by the way. But so we were able to talk about movies. We introduced a couple of movies. Um, including uh, uh, John Ford, uh, The Searchers was one of them. And uh, so that was thrilling. But, you know, um, uh, you know, Mel Brooks was great. The challenges of, you know, Sophia Loren and Max von Sydow, I'm intimidated by, apparently by uh, uh, European stars. <laughs> and uh, they were both great. Um, uh, Mel Brooks has been a blast every time. We got to know Mel a little bit. Peter Bogdanovich tells these great stories. Um, uh, Angie Dickinson and Eve Marie Saint are the people I've had the most fun with. Uh, and then, you know, uh, Tarantino was a, a challenge, not because he was difficult, but because it was so interesting and I was sort of constantly afraid that he was going to expose me. Um, <laughs> I asked him at one point, because uh, my favorite Tarantino film was Jackie Brown, I said, well, you know, I know you see Jackie Brown as more mainstream film. What do you say to a, you know, and I'm obviously talking about myself, you know, it's like, oh, what do you say to a a Tarantino fan who says that Jackie Brown is, the, is their best, is their favorite Tarantino movie. And uh, and he goes, well, I would say to them, they're not really a Tarantino fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was, you know, he was like, no, I'm really proud of Jackie Brown. And then like, you know, some of the ones that were a challenge in, in unique ways, and I'm so, you know, Faye Dunaway. Um, so I, I don't want him to be easy. And I, I, I enjoyed uh, that process with this sort of uh, brilliant and, and complicated actress that, uh, you know, it was in these five critical films between 1967 and 76, which is to me the 
most interesting time in, uh, in American movie history. Absolutely. Uh, well, I love, uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. And I love that sure. your, your grandfather's finally, you know, getting the credit. I know, although you didn't, you didn't really get to, was he, he passed away before you were born? Is that oh, right? long, long before 19, 1953. Uh, so it's really nice. I mean, now my image, you know, a little bit, it was used to be John Malkovich from uh, RKO 281, the HBO movie. And, uh, but now I think of my grandpa, I think it feels like Gary Oldman just captured him, uh, uh, captured him perfectly. So it was really nice. It was moving. First, the movie's called Mank. It's insane. They must say the word Mank 85 times in the movie. And, yeah. uh, you know, just about everybody in our family has at one time or another been called it, some almost exclusively. So it was just crazy. I mean, I got emotional when the title card came up. I'm like, I, I can't believe you're making a movie about my grandpa. This is nuts. So you know, it was crazy. a screenwriter that most people have never heard of, you know, overwhelmingly most people have never heard of. So, uh, uh, it was nice. And it's great to talk to you because, you know, there was there, you know, if you'd asked me to name call letters from growing up in D.C., I just would have said WTOP. That's, you know, it was what you listen to for news, you know, when I was a kid throughout forever, you know, and uh, and great call letters, too. So, you know, I'm, I'm, it's fun to be. I know there's been a lot of changes in D.C. media, but it's still fun to be talking to WTOP. Oh, yeah. We, well, we appreciate it. And I love at the end, you know, that Mank gets to hold the Oscar and sort of get the final word right there before the credits. Do you know, before we run, do you know what happened to that Oscar? Like my good friend and mentor, Arch Campbell, always thought, you know, Arch. Uh, of course, yeah. He, he tells the, he tells this story that he was at a party in DuPont Circle one time and got said, hey, someone called him into a side room and said there was the Oscar to Citizen Kane there. He loves that story. But where is it today? Do you know? Well, that was my father's um, apartment uh, in uh, Adams Morgan, just you know, Adams Morgan. Five, five minutes from, yeah. But I mean, it was five minutes from DuPont Circle. So, you know, it was at uh, Connecticut and Columbia Road. So, um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, dad had the Oscar. It was willed to him. Um, the screenplay was uh, willed to both my grandfather and his brother and the sled to my uncle. So they sort of split things up. One of the sleds, it wasn't used in the movie, but Ben Heck, Gave it to my grandfather at the rap party. That's how the story goes. The actual rap um, <laughs> The one of the one ones of many, that yeah. apparently wasn't used, but it was still, you know, it still says Rosebud and it's still from, from Citizen Kane. So, so cool. um, and then uh, anyway, the long story short, my dad's a very, was always a very generous guy. He, he was not sentimental, probably in a good way. And uh, anyway, they sold the Oscar. They sold the screenplay first. Um, because uh, somebody in the family needed money. And then they sold the Oscar because somebody in the family needed money. And even though it was my dad's, he gave a cut of that uh, out. And, you know, it, it's just what my dad would have done. And uh, amazingly, the screenplay went for my grandfather's notes, went for more than the Oscar. I think if they'd held on to the Oscar, it'd be worth a lot of money now. But they sold it at auction and somebody bought it and got a good deal, got a good deal <laughs> on it. But it cost a fair amount of money to insure. So they had taken it off the shelf where Arch saw it. Uh, and had uh, uh, put it in a safe deposit box, uh, you know, and my grandfather thought, my father thought, excuse me, well, if you're going to put it in a safe deposit box, what's the point? Like, right. also, he didn't need to look at it. He was like, he knows his dad wrote it. He knows yeah. his dad won an Oscar, you know, I don't, and if somebody wants to pay an exorbitant amount of money for it, so if my dad could help somebody, he, 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 uh, uh, he would have done it. My, like Herman, like his father, which you'll see in Mank, there was a, a great generosity in my dad, Herman. You know, the story of Herman is somebody needed two thousand dollars. You give them three thousand because he'd be like, "Well, you need the two thousand to sort out your problem, and then you have the other thousand to help get back on your feet, <laughs> help right. start making money again." So he didn't value money, and, uh, and my dad uh, valued money, of course, the more. But he he shared that uh, generous spirit that his dad had. Yeah, and e getting even getting some people out of Nazi Germany. I love that scene in the movie too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. true. I don't know if he got out as many as the movie portrays, but he, he did. He was, and quietly, you know, yeah. um, uh, uh, you know, he knew the, the threat of fascism. He was an aggressive anti-communist, but he, he knew the, the, the threat of fascism. For sure. Well, thanks so much. This, this was a great talking with you. Um, again, everyone, it's, it's Mank, David Fincher's Mank. It comes on Netflix December 4th. I think it might be a limited theatrical release before that in this bizarre year of hell we're living yeah. in. It's hard to predict, yeah. but uh, thanks so much for joining us. Pat Mankiewicz. Yeah, third. Uh, uh, thanks for having me.